Father in heaven, you are the author of truth. And the Bible has clearly told us that holy men of faith spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we can conclude without a doubt that unless the Holy Spirit also moves us to understand what was written by those that were moved by him, we can surely grow in darkness. But we want to thank you for the light. We want to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Give unto us your measure of the gift that we might be saved through the knowing of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Daniel chapter 9 ended yesterday by telling us that Jesus would come and he would confirm the covenant in one year, one sorry, seven years, and in the middle of the seven years Jesus would die and the sacrifices will end, and after the seven years the nation of Israel will be left on its own and the gospel will go on to the entire world. But this also troubled Daniel and Daniel wanted to know more. So the Bible tells us that Daniel was still in the prayerful mood and the angel came to him and told him these words. And as for me, in the first year of Dallas, I stood the man, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And that is the man. And so the Bible says, and now I will show you the truth, behold, Three more kings shall arise in Persia. Now when the Bible says I stood up to strengthen him, this is the experience that happened when Daniel was praying. Now Cyrus had given a decree to rebuild the temple in Babylon. But the, the, the Chaldeans who are fighting against Daniel and his people in the book of Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 5, those Chaldeans were persuading the king to reverse this edict that we read about yesterday, that Israel may not be rebuilt. And so the Bible says, the angel Daniel says, I went over to the king of Persia so that I can wrestle with the enemy and wrestle so that he does not change his mind. And after that, after 21 days, he came and revealed something to Daniel. That's what we discovered yesterday. And so the Bible says, he says, I went and stood and strengthened the Median Darius so that he might not change his mind. In fact, history tells us that Darius was given poison. The priests put poison in food and they brought him in an offering and he was given poison because they wanted to reverse that because they knew that when the Israel become independent, then they will no longer be slaves in Babylon. But the angels were working behind the scenes to make sure that the prophecy comes to pass. So the angel comes and says, Daniel, I've been working, but nevertheless, let me tell you something more. So the Bible says, and now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia. Three more. And if you go by history, if the first king is Cyrus, because by the time they is speaking, Cyrus is the king of Persia, the, first, the son of Cyrus, the first one was Cambius, who reigned from 5300 to 522, and he reigned for only eight years. And when he died, there was a, a gap in between there. There is someone who wanted to take the throne, and he reigned for only seven months, so he's not counted because he was an imposter. He was not in the line of leadership. He just took over because the king was killed in a moment. And so he took the chance and stayed on the throne for seven months until he was pushed out. And so the second king we have is Darius Hastapes. And if you read the text very well, yesterday, Cyrus was the first to give a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And if you are here yesterday, this was the one who gave the second decree to rebuild the temple in in, in, in Israel. And so the Bible says the second one, the third one was Taxes or Auseras in the book of Esther. So those are the three kings that the Bible gives to our attention. This one reigned for eight years, this one 36, and this one for 21 years. But the Bible does not stop there. The Bible continues to give more additional instructions. It says, and the fourth shall be a far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches. He shall steer up all against the kingdom of the Greece. Now, so far, we are at the point. The angel has identified that we are in the period of Medes and Persia. And he has said there will be three more kings that will come. In fact, four. But he says the fourth one will be far richer than the previous ones. And we are told that this man, according to history, who was the fourth king, his name was Ataxasus, and he reigned from 465 to 423, and he reigned 42 years. Now, this one was depicted in history as extremely rich. 
In fact, they say that he would buy off all his, uh, those he made an alliance with. In case you agreed, disagreed with him, he would buy you off because he had a lot of money and many people succumbed to his power. So he was extremely rich. And when he was rich, he felt that it was prudent to attack Greece. And he attacked Greece, and that caused the problem because down the years, Darius III, one of his grandchildren, when he went to attack the Grecian Empire, came in with the help of Alexander the Great, and they crushed Meds and Persia, and that was the end of the Meds and Persia. So the Bible tells us that at this point, this king will begin to antagonize Greece, and that will be initiate. The fall of Persia, just like Belshazzar initiated the fall of Babylon. And so, if you are with me, the Bible says, then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. While the other one is rich and boastful, there along the time, a mighty king shall arise. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others beside thee. And if you are here yesterday, according to Daniel chapter 8, the Bible says the God had a little horn, and when it attacked, it broke off and four came up. And the Bible told us clearly that the power of those four that came up did not match the power of Alexander the Great. And they did not come from his loin. So they only were his general. And that's why the Bible says it is not from his posterity, meaning they did not descend from him. They were only external to the throne. And they took the throne. That's why their authority can never be like them. Let me remind you about... Uh, 821. This is how 821 reveals. And the male god is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eye is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. So you see that Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11 are consistent. Daniel chapter 8 told us there was a ram which was Medan Persia. Daniel chapter 11 tells us that the Medan Persia will have four kings and the fourth king will antagonize Greece and Greece will rise up and then Greece will defeat the Persian and then as the Greece rise up, the dominant king which is Alexander the Great shall be broken and then his kingdom shall be divided into four. Now this is amazing because God is consistent in his visions and in his promises. Prophecy. And so the Bible says, if you want to map it again, I suppose we look at the map again. This is how it will look like. Daniel chapter 2 looks like this. Daniel chapter 7 looks like this. Daniel chapter 8 looks like this. And Rome is inside here before the little horn comes. Daniel chapter 11, 1 to 2 describes Persia, so it's along this. Daniel chapter 11, 3 and 4 describes the Grecian Empire. So we are here in Daniel chapter 4. In other words, the four dreams in the book of Daniel all agree and they are all the same. Only that each vision expands the previous. So that's why yesterday I told the other day, the vision of Daniel chapter 7 is the center. It's like uh, the real thing. Everything on the left and on the right map to that vision at Daniel chapter 7. So when you understand Daniel chapter 7, then you are able to understand Daniel chapter 2, or Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 11. And so that means that the power that will come here must also correspond somehow to Rome and the little horn, if this is consistent, and I would like to share with you in a while what that would be. Now, listen, look at this, how certain the prophecy is. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 45, the Bible says, The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. That is Daniel chapter 2. But look at Daniel chapter 10 verse 21. The Bible says, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds these things against me except Michael, your prince. So the words that are being spoken are taken from the scripture of truth. And if you are here yesterday, the word truth means dependable, reliable, and sure. So the dream is certain. The interpretation is Sure, and it is taken from the scripture of, and then finally in Daniel chapter 11 verse 2, the Bible says, and now I will tell you the truth. 
That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not despise, do not quench the spirit. And in 20 says, do not despise prophecy. Because prophecy is sure and certain. It will come exactly as God has said. That's why the scripture said, which we read the memory text, Isaiah 42, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with anyone, not even with the craven images. Have you seen, I have told you the things in the past and they have been fulfilled. And now I stand, I will tell you those that will come. I will tell them to you. And he has told them to us in Daniel before they were. In Revelation, he has added more. So if people are patient and they are willing to labor and understand these things, they can provide such a strong wealth of knowledge for them in order to live. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 introduces a new dimension. The Bible says, Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he, and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. Now, the king of the south is very interesting. Uh, let me break off here a little bit and tell you something. When God is communicating, even when you read the Bible, when God is communicating, pay attention to the symbols he uses because symbols have significant meaning. For example, Daniel chapter 2, God uses metals and the human image. And you remember if you are here, I told you, Babylonian culture and the myth thereof, human structure represented future events. And so when Nebuchadnezzar sees this dream, he knows that he's dealing with future event. Why? Because even when Daniel's interpreting, he says, oh king, you are on your bed thinking about what shall be. So Nebuchadnezzar was thinking about the future, and God uses an image that speaks about the future. In Daniel chapter 7, God uses beasts. Because also beasts referred to nation, lion to Babylon. So it was familiar. In Daniel chapter 8 yesterday, the, the Bible uses two animals, the ram and the goat. And why? Because the ram and the goat speak to the atonement. And because the prince is going to die in the middle of the week and become the savior of all, Jesus Christ, our lamb that takes away the sins of the world, it was important for God to change the symbols so that he can direct the mind of his people to the actual event atonement. But now he's changing and he's using the, tithe, the terms north and south. The question is, why is God using these terms? What are they in reference to? And that is my task this morning. Once I have made known to you some of these, probably it will make a difference for you and it will track. Let us look at the structure of the book of Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11 so that you see how they are similar. In Daniel chapter 8, the first kingdom is Persia and in Daniel chapter 11, the first king is Persia. The Daniel chapter 8, the second is Greece, second is Greece. Rome comes in here and it's alluded to, it's not very clear but the little horn comes here and guess what here you have north and south conflict between chapter verse 5 and 39 and at the time of the end we are told there will be the end and the time shall come to an end. Let us do a little comparison with Daniel chapter 8 of this power. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 11 verse 36 and the king shall do as he will, that is the king of the north. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper until the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. That is Daniel chapter 11 verse 36, 37. The angel is explaining the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. Now look at Daniel chapter 8 verse 10. The Bible says, it grew even to the host of heaven and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. So here in Daniel chapter 8, chapter 11 this power, the northern power exalts itself and magnifies itself above God. Here it also raises its head towards heaven. Alright now let us look at another, another one here Another one is here in Daniel chapter verse 37 says, He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers, nor to the one beloved by women. Women have beloved gods. Eh? He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. And then here it says, It became great even as great as the prince of hosts. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. When you overthrow the sanctuary, that's where God met his people. That means you have overthrown God. So in Daniel chapter 11, 
And Daniel chapter 8, the beast that is described in Daniel chapter 11, 8, which is the little horn, is described in chapter 11, but using the term north. Number two, the scripture says that this beast will establish itself in the beautiful land. When you read Daniel 11 verse 16, as they describe the northern kingdom, the Bible says, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. And when you read Daniel 8, 9, he says, And out of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. Surely, the power, which is the northern king, and the power, which is the little horn in Daniel chapter 8, are the same because the description is the same. Number three, it says, It shall attack the saints of God and the holy covenant. Look at this one. Daniel eleven twenty eight. 28. While returning to his land, the northern king, with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. And look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 12. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. If you are here yesterday, you remember the word truth, eh? Is the same as a myth, which is the law and the commandments and Jesus. Let us do a little mathematics looking at the three visions. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, the Bible says, He speaks pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change the times and... Uh -huh. That is the little horn there. Now, the little horn in Daniel chapter 8 verse 12, look at what it does. Because of transgression of the enemy was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast the truth down to the ground. And Daniel chapter 12, 11, verse 28, while returning on his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved and against the holy covenant. Now, this one is clear. The law is clear. If you are here yesterday, I proved to you that the word here translated in the Old Testament, a myth for truth, is the same word used, for example, to refer to commandments, law, and the word. And in the New Testament is one we translate truly or verily, verily, which is amen. And in Hebrew it means to obey, to be faithful to the expressed will of God. So this, this beast, in Daniel 7, it is described as changing times and law. In Daniel 8, 12, it's required as changing truth. Here it is given as the holy covenant. Let me share with you a little more. The Bible says in Daniel 11.30, For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved, and returning in rage against the holy covenant, and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. In other words, let me summarize because it's a long passage. This king goes and fights. And as he comes back, he comes to the glorious land. And then in the glorious land, he takes the holy covenant of God and he wants to fight it. And then he fights it and then he discovers that there are people who have accepted what it is doing and breaking it. So he rewards them. He regards them with favor. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says they shall receive a mark here and a mark in other words, those who don't believe the Sabbath as to be true, but they are tied by economics and the world thing will receive the mark here by force, at least because of circumstances. Those who have by iniquity refused to believe the Sabbath will believe it and they will receive the mark in the forehead because in the forehead is where people believe. So there are some people who will believe that the contrary to the Sabbath is the truth. So they believe it and they will do it. There are others who believe that the contrary is not the truth, but they want to survive. So they receive the mark here. Economics. I must do my papers. I must survive. Pure. This job I can't leave. Pure. You know the truth, but circumstances. So the Bible says they are, you will be rewarded. The king of the north will reward you. The job you will get. The world will praise you. 
But let me share with you what the Holy Covenant means so that you can get to know that God is consistent. The Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 through 6, the Bible says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen how what I did to the Egyptian, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, God delivered Israel from Egypt by his own hand, and his intention was to bring them to himself so that they can become his people. And then he says to them, Now therefore, having done all that and saved you, now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. The Bible says Moses went down and he told them exactly those words. And the people said, we shall obey. So the Bible says Moses went up back to God and said, they have said, they are in agreement. So you can make a covenant with them. Now, this is strange because obeying the voice of God, you know, eh? the Bible, not so. When God speaks, he speaks, and now you have the Bible, which is the authoritative voice of, of God. But what is the covenant? Because if you are to keep it, you must know it. Now, let me show you what Moses, thinks the co what Moses knows the covenant to be. Moses describes what happened on that day. When God came down, he says, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. In other words, God spoke, so they had this voice. But they must, they must keep his commandment. And the Bible says, so he declared to you his covenant, which is, which he commanded you to perform, which is. If you are going to rewrite that scripture, it would be, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my Ten Commandments, then you shall be to me a treasure, a special people. So in the, the king of the north attacks the holy covenant of God. In other words, it attacks the commandments of God, the Ten. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible says it will intend to change times and law. In Daniel chapter 8, it will change truth and tamper with which truth is the same as the commandments and the law. In Daniel chapter 11, he will tamper with the holy covenant. And it's the same thing. In Daniel chapter 7, God is saying the same thing. In Daniel chapter 8, he's saying the same thing because it's the same power. You see, someone might say that is Old Testament. Let me talk to you about the New Testament. Jeremiah speaks about the old new covenant, which is the New Testament. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers. Day I took them out of Egypt by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So God says, the old covenant I made with these people, I am going to make a new one. Now, if God is going to make a new one, he must tell us what is the content. Because the content of the Old Testament covenant, we know it as the Ten Commandments. So if God is going to make a new covenant, he must tell us the content so that we might keep it. And then the Bible says in verse 33. And by the way, Paul quotes this in Hebrews chapter 8, if you want to make reference. Uh, Paul, then Paul, the Bible says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord, I will put my law in there and write them on there and I will be there and they shall be my. So what is the covenant? That power will seek to tamper with God's law. Even the new covenant, when Jesus took the cup and said, this is the cup of the blood for the new covenant, Jesus was simply saying, this is the cup that is going to rewrite the old covenant and is going to give people an opportunity to interface with God and become God's people, God's special people. God is writing a new covenant. The difference is that the old one was written on tablets of stone. This one will be written on. The content is the same. The place is different. And the power that writes is the same. 
Because when you read the book of Deuteronomy, they say, and God wrote the covenant, the, co the content of the covenant with his finger. By the finger of God, he wrote on the tablets of stone. So the Bible says, by the same finger of the spirit, he will write them on our human hearts. And no one will tell another who God is. Paul knew this, and that's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he says this. You are our epistle written in our heart. Known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living. Where is it written? Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the flesh. That is the heart. I will make a new covenant. So that means Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11 all agree to the effect and the activity of that power. So the power in Daniel chapter 7, which is the little horn, the power in Daniel chapter 8, which is the little horn, is the same power in Daniel chapter 11, which is described as the king of the north. Look at Revelation, which we say they gave yesterday. Revelation says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings. Who do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you were to rewrite that statement, it would be, he went to the people who have a covenant with God through Jesus Christ. So you can say that the commandments do not matter. But I would like to tell you that the content of the covenant in the New Testament is still the commandments. The difference is by the Spirit of God. And then Revelation 14 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. By the way, in the book of Revelation, the word commandments appear only three times. Revelation 12, 7, Revelation 14, 12, and Revelation 22, 14. And listen to Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of, and may enter through the gates of the... Time is gone. But let me tell you, young people, if you read philosophy... There is something that happened in philosophy, and that, and for you, because some of us don't read the thing, they have covered them on us. So we are not. Before philosophy came and this new science, which we have, new theology and new science, people in the old, they were using one method of looking at truth. In philosophy, they call it antithesis, which means you have what is right and you have what is good. When you say swimming is bad, it means not swimming is good. That is how our apostles would interpret scripture. When the Bible says keeping the commandment is good, it means keeping, not keeping the commandment is bad. But along the way, as philosophy came, there came a man called William Hegel. He introduced a new form. It is called the Hegelian principle. And it says, no, no, that is, that is being too conservative. You must have a thesis, which we use when we are doing our masters and degrees. We use that, eh? You must have the real, the ideal, and the real. Then let them fight, fight, and get a resolution. So you must have a thesis and an antithesis. But the solution, the answer is not between these two. It is inside here in the middle. So let them fight. Hmm? Commandment, no commandment. Commandment, no commandment. Uh -huh. Then in the middle you say, no, you can't be there. And so since that time, that principle has influenced everything we do, even in politics. That is why people believe, in fact, they say, if you want something to be done, you must first allow things to conflict, for example. First allow people to fight, then you can bring peace. Peace cannot come until people first fight. So you must have sethis and sethis. Let them box, box, box. When they are tired, you say the solution is here. Can't we come here in the middle? And it is also in our theology. That's why people are liberal. They say, no, 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 God is not so strict like that. God, no, we can put commandments here, put no commandments here. Let them fight a bit then in the middle, in the middle. And many of us, because we do not know the history of the thought, we are being deceived. And the Bible in prophecy tells us that do not be deceived because the enemy of God is after God. 
And the only way he can do that is by persuading many people to his side. There are two ways of persuading people, by force or by deceit. Machiavelli says, a good prince must know when to use a carrot and when to use a stick. So you can beacon if someone is foolish enough to eat the carrot, let him come. Oh, ah. But in the moment you discover he's so stubborn, persecute. Use a carrot. That's why yesterday you remember the Bible says during the power's time, deceit will prosper. Don't you remember that? And when it fails, he said he will persecute, cast down the saints. So you people, you sit here, and God is saying you are in serious trouble. Your victory can only be in Christ Jesus. All other ground is sinking, son, except Jesus' ground. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one goes to the Father except me. And Jesus says, if you love me, When you look at that statement in the light of prophecy, Jesus was simply saying, when that time comes and my law is changed, my people stay by the word. If you love me, stay put. So in principle, the beast of Daniel chapter 7, 25, Daniel 8 from 8 to 12 is the same as Daniel 11, in the reference of the northern king. But Daniel, and that is the beast of the little horn. Why? Because the activities are the same. The descriptions are the same. And if it looks like a duck, then it is a duck. That's what they say. When you find something that looks like a duck, bucks like a duck, sorry, quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. And so look, when you look at the structure of the book, this is how it is. Because it's a big one and it's afternoon, I just wanted to summarize for you. You can go back and read. Now, Daniel is using what we call, in Hebrew, there is, when they are writing. You know, these days we don't think about when we are writing. Eh? Those people are literally experts. Eh? In Hebrew, there is what they call a chiastic eh? structure. People write things starting from here, going down. Then they go back again, the same things, but using different language. And that is born out of parallelism. For example, Dan, Ma, Rev, Psalms 19, you know that verse, eh? verse 1, says, the heaven declare the glory of God, and the firmament show forth his handwork. Now, when you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, the Bible says, and God said, let us make a firmament in the midst of the waters to divide the waters. Eh? And so God fed the firmament and divided the waters which were above from the waters which were below. And then the Bible says, eight, and God said, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning, and that was the second day. So the firmament and the heaven is the same thing. But what the Hebrews do for emphasis, they will write one thing and repeat it, but using another word that is the same for purposes of it being emphatic. That's why it's the heavens they are the glory of God. The firmament, which is the heaven, show forth his handwork. The glory of God is the same as his handwork. The heaven is the same as the firmament. So even in the book of Daniel, Daniel uses that. And Daniel uses what we call the threes. You remember the book of chapter 7. Eh? It was divided into three. One, two, three. He uses the threes. Eh? And even here he uses three. For example, I've used A to indicate the three. The first part, which is chiastic, on the side from verse 5 to 8, with verse 5, you have, with great power, the king of the south goes. On verse uh, 13, you have, with a huge army, much equipment, the king of the north goes. So you have great power, huge army. Alliances between the south, and they are initiated by the south in verse 6. Alliances between the north and the south, initiated by the north in verse 17, and also 20 and 23. So what is happening this way is also happening the other side. And then you have alliance fails, alliance fails. A daughter is given, verse 6, a daughter is given, verse 17. Standing in a place and will enter the fortress, standing at his place and will turn back towards the fortress. Chiastic. Eh? You come, you go. And in part B of number 2 of the thing, he says again, a great army, verse 9, a large army, verse 25. Sons of the king of the north will prepare for the war against the realm of the king of the south. He will stir up the strength against the king of the north. Sweep 
like a flood. I'm a swept like a flood. Now you see here it has changed. The other one was south-north. Now it is north-south. So he's on the other side like this. So when you read the book of Daniel, there is a lot of linguistic playing. Daniel uses a lot of literary activity because Daniel was an expert in Babylonian literature. He studied for three years and was studying language. So Daniel uses his skill to make sure the works come out eh, with such power and artistic style. And then finally, in the last section of the book of Daniel, chapter 11, chapter 11, the south again changes, and now the north on the other side. The king's heart will be filled with pride, but his heart will be set up, which is the same as filled with pride. We'll slaughter many thousand, many will join them. And so the interplay is the same. If we are to conclude, the Bible concludes with this phrase, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. The south attacks the north in Daniel 48, the north attacks the south in the next verse. Partial victory is gained towards the beautiful land. And then in Daniel chapter 11, 42, the north attacks the south. The north attacks the south again. And so you can see what we call chiastic. Now this is the center, the beautiful land. They come down, now they go back. And then the south allies with the north and attacks the holy mountain from above. Supernatural end of the kingdom of the north, one will not help it as it has been said in the previous. So when you go back home, you can try and read this entire chapter in that way. But for me, my task is only to explain to you something to do with the north and the south so that you get a global picture. Now when the Bible uses the term north and south in conjunction, it is alluding to the biblical concept. Let me also tell you this. From Daniel chapter 8 onwards, Daniel writes in Hebrew. Daniel chapter 7 is in Aramaic, which can be read by everyone. But when he comes to Daniel chapter 8 and to 12, he changes the language and writes in Hebrew. He's simply saying, if you are to understand this section, it has a lot to do with the Hebrew thought, the Hebrew Bible. So if you don't know your Bible, you can't appreciate. That's why in Hebrews chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, there is a God and the ram, going back to the Bible. Here there is south and north, going back to the Bible. Because when you read Psalms 89, verse 11 to 13, the Bible says, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Taba and Hama rejoice in your name, you have a mighty hand. Strong is your hand, O Lord, and high is your right hand. When the Bible uses north and south, it is simply using it in terms of the scope, the entirety of the operation. So when it is used as a combination, it speaks to the same. Ezekiel 21, 3 to 4 says, And say to the land of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its teeth and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword shall go out of its teeth against all flesh, from south to... In other words, nothing will escape the sword of God. So when someone uses north and south, it is simply speaking to the fact that what is happening is of a universal effect. This power is going to affect the universal scope, these powers. When it is used separately in the Bible, it evokes this kind of section. Isaiah 14, verse 31 says, Wail, O gate, cry, O city, all you Philistine, Philistia, are dissolved. For smoke will come from the north, and no one will be alone in his appointed times. When it is used alone, north represents a place where calamity comes from. In fact, when you read Jeremiah 1.14, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north, calamity shall break forth of all the inhabitants of the land. When God chooses to use the term north for the king, the little horn, is simply saying that this little horn will unleash terror and calamity on God's people, which is the same as persecute. When you read Isaiah 14, it describes the devil and his attempt to overthrow God. And this is how the Bible describes the devil. It says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of how are you cut down to the ground? You who weakened what? Mm -hmm. Verse 13 says, For you have said 
in your heart, I will ascend into, uh, do you remember the little horn? I will. And the Bible said it will cast down the stars. Don't you remember that yesterday? The Bible says, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of. So under which power is the little horn operating? That's why Revelation 13 says, and that beast received its power from the dragon. Because the actions, the intentions are the same. The Bible says, I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation of the farthest side of the. What God is communicating with the term north is that this power that challenges him wants to unseat his throne. And by doing that, that's why it has even the boldness to say, I am God. I can change what God has established. Isaiah 14 says, the devil says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I'll be like the most high God. So God in using north, he's speaking to us to the effect, if we are biblical students, that the power we are dealing with has underneath the characteristic desire to overthrow the throne of God. The competition, the battle, is not between you and me. The battle is of a great controversy between Christ and the devil. It's about thrones. It's a game of, as people say. I have heard that word. Isn't it correct? It is correct. It exists. The game of thrones. Ah, then I thought I was uh, on a different planet. Thank God I'm still a human being. <laughs> Where are the game? What the Bible says, when the Bible uses the word north, it simply says that this power, if you read your scripture, is the same power that wants to overthrow God. And from it, calamity comes. Its intention is to trample upon the saints of God and to persecute them. And if you are wise, then you must stay yourself in Christ because that's the only way you will overcome. What about south? Now, Egypt was in the south, of course, and that's why the general who took over on the south is Ptolemy, Ptolemy who is took off Alexandria in the south as well, which is Egypt. Now, Egypt is in the south, but look at what Egypt uh, is described as in the Bible. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. I hear the same cry in the French Revolution. Who is God for us? We are reasonable people. Bring your reason here. Is God a man or a? Then you begin to wonder, can you tell me? So that since you don't have an answer, they will say stop talking about religion. If you cannot know exactly how, which form God is. Who is the Lord? And then Isaiah 30, at 1 to 3 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. The term south represents those people who turn their eyes on humanity. That's why Mark 7, 7 says, In vain do they worship me, for they keep for the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God. They are people trusted in man. And yet the Bible says, Psalms 146, I think verse 3 says, that do not put your trust in the son of man, in his flesh. So the word south represents those who reject the notion of God and they would like to employ it by their own reason. That is why in verse 2 the Bible says, Yet he, the king of the south, also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his word, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. That is God himself. So the Bible says those who trust in the king of the south or in the power that rejects God shall be like that. Used again separately, verse 3 says, Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are 
flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. So the helper and the LP all will fall. <laughs> so God is purposeful in using north and south. Because he uses north, he wants to talk about some religious power with the intention to unseat his throne. When he talks about south, he's talking about people who reject God in their reason and they think they can do it by their own might. That's why Psalms 20 verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we remember the name of the Lord our God. The saints will remember God. The saints will trust God, not man, not the northern king. They will reject anything that violates God. That's why they say, here is the patience of the saints. They have been so patient through tribulation, through hardship. Calamity has come from the north upon them, but they have endured by the grace of God through the living power of Christ. They have refused to break. They have said, no, whether you take my life, take my life if you want, but I and the Lord I have made up my mind and I'm not turning back. And in the dark ages, it was evidence. And so, in simple terms, in the book of Daniel chapter 11, northern power represents the religious ecclesiastical power that plays the role of God on earth, acting as the sole intercessor between wretched humanity and God. And if you are here the other day, I showed you that power that claims such. But the south represents the philosophical political movements which fight against conservatism and fanatism with the weapon of reason. And that is what we call today the science. Science wants to prove everything. If it's not proved, then it is not real. My good friends, the Bible tells us that even these kings also get sometimes and they fight against each other. Reason also fights against the church. That is why in the French Revolution 1700s, when the French people were tired of this uh, northern people, they fought it and they crushed it. Genobathia came and took the Pope's slave. He said, to hell with this thing called God. For us, our God is reason. So they went, had sex the way they want. They went, they were fornicators. They were sleepover to their boyfriends. They, no God, they just do anything. They also persecuted some emperors who were pagan, the northern king. In fact, Nero was persecuted for not believing in the gods of Roman Empire. That is why when the fire broke up in Rome, Nero had some problems. Eh? And he accused the Christian. Even Diocletian, who was the very evil, the person who was present when John wrote his book of Revelation, the one who took him to the island of Patmos, very cruel. But even the, the church was strong against these guys. He said, for you, for sure, you are too evil. Some of us are evil, but for you, you are evil squared. How come you know, no, this is not acceptable. You are too evil for life. The church said, ah, this is too much. So there are even gets time when the king of the north fights against the king of. But the Bible says they will gain together. They will gain their strength against the children of God at the appointed time. Where those who believe in reason and those who believe in the church but contrary to God's will will combine effort to persecute those who say the commandments of God are valid, his voice is valid, that is his word is valid. So both movements constantly wage war with each other, e.g. the French Revolution versus the Catholic Church. Persecution of the pagan emperors and our present ideologies of science and materialistic forms also challenge the faith and each other. And so in summary, my good friends, when you look at the calendar, this is what we have. In Daniel chapter 11, 1 to 2, it's the maids and Persia. In Daniel chapter 11, 3 and 4, it is Greece. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 4, it is Rome, which is also included in Daniel 8. And Daniel chapter 11 onwards, the entire section that remains is to the king of the north and the king of the south. But it is the king of the north that represents the little horn. The king of the south only represents the philosophical underpinning. I would like to submit to you, my good friends, 
God is spot on in everything he has declared. And let me say to you as I conclude. In the book of Psalms, chapter 62, verse 11, the Bible says, Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Now, just think about it. David is listening to the voice of God. Then God speaks once. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Then David says, when that came, I heard it twice. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. I said, this is serious. Now, the question I have for you. Suppose God speaks four times. How many times do you have to hear? Oh, this is serious. That means what the Bible is simply saying, the prophecy is so serious that God's people cannot take it for granted because it's so serious. If you are God's child, you must listen eight times. That's how serious it is. In fact, it was Eric, Rick Warren. You remember? Your priorities define your interests. And time is the greatest gift you can give to someone. That's why God says in the Ten Commandments, Thou shall not have any other God besides me. You shall not make graven images, neither bow down to worship them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. For in six days you shall do all your labors. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, he created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. And so the Bible says even your children, even your maids, even your animals must have a rest. If you are here yesterday, you remember even land rests. You, you notice? Land rests. Now what about human beings? And then verse, the, the fifth commandment says, respect your father and your mother. And the sixth says, you shall not, shall not murder eh, or kill. Eh? You shall not commit. Let me add for campuses, fornication. <laughs> and I'm serious on this. Some of you, you are taking these things lightly. But even if you keep the Sabbath, James told us when you break one and keep nine, you are doing nothing. So even if you come here and you are sleeping with someone, you are doing nothing. Go on and have fun. And I'm honest with you. That's why Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve. It must be either God or... And I'm speaking this in the light of Proverbs 27.5. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. I love you brothers and sisters. But... Permit me to say these things for our salvation. The battle is serious, and we must take it seriously. God says, the devil will trample this truth, and you must make a decision either for truth or against truth. And that decision is everyday decision. Every day you wake up in the morning, you must choose to be God's child or walk away. I'm glad you chose today to be God's child, and you are here. And so the Bible says you shall not kill. In fact, the Bible says when you hate your brother, you have killed. So it's not only getting a panga. Some of you have killed many, including those who are here. They are only still alive by God's grace. <laughs> and the Bible says you shall not accuse your brother or sister falsely. Some of you have accused the brethren falsely. And then the Bible says you shall not covet your neighbor's property, including his wife and the children. So Priscilla must be protected. <laughs> but the Bible says you shall not covet your neighbor's property. My good friends, I want to submit to you that is the holy covenant of God. And the Spirit's interest is to write it on your heart. You can say yes or no. My duty was to present it before you. The book of Daniel in four stages tells you what is coming. And at every stage repeats the same thing for emphasis. That the days in which we are going are difficult days. But a man that finds himself in Christ shall stand until the last. I hope that you'll be there when Jesus comes. Mm -hmm.